It's going to be here. It looks like it's settled down. So um, this is something I've hooked up, uh, or I came up with based on my experience working with a lot of legacy Perl and a lot of very clever programmers who, uh, you know, they, they're just using Perl to get stuff done and then they get a bug and they can't find out why, why it happens. And it's because we're all smart people and we all know how to do a lot of things, but it turns out a lot of things are a lot more complicated than they seem. Um, and this is where uh, there are a lot of CPAN modules that are essential to keeping you from, you know, um, uh, shooting yourself in the foot. So, thanks for coming. I'm, uh, this is a pretty big crowd. And uh, we've got a lot, of, uh, a lot of space to cover. I have handouts at the very front um, for people who want to take them, uh, the list of modules that I'm, that I'm going to cover, along with a whole slew that I ended up leaving out because I decided they either weren't really truly essentials or I just don't have time for them. So this is a talk about the essentials, the things the pieces of code, the modules on CPAN, um, and the tools that are essential to getting my job done and hopefully you getting your job done. These are the things that I use to get my job done better, faster, so I can go out and drink beer or spend, well, mitten. Right, anyway. Okay, so the point is I can actually have time to do the other things that I want to do instead of going back and fixing all the little corner cases. First, I want to uh, lead off with this. Um, so I've got this list of things that I call essentials, but there's already an awesome, awesome list of, of absolutely essential stuff in a bundle on CPAN and package on CPAN called Task Kencho. And there have been other talks on it in the past, but I highly, highly recommend that you, you go through Task Kencho and install everything that pertains to you because these are people that have gone through and picked the best of the best. Not always the newest, not always, you know, the most clever, but the stuff that's solid in everyday work, um, you know, things for XML, things for, uh, for web services, um, you know, and just about anything you can think of. And if there's something that you really think is essential and you think should be on Task Kencho, contact the maintainer. Um, I, think his, uh, I think it's Chris Prather still, but it might be a Pieron, um, whose real name I don't know. But this talk isn't about Task Kencho because you can look that up. But it is about the stuff I think is essential. Um, I'm wearing a shirt. It says, be reasonable. Do it my way. So, um, so this may not be the best stuff for you, but it's been the stuff that over the years I've discovered really is the best thing for me to do in my work. So I can go and watch Dancing with the Stars. All right. These are the modules and tools I depend on day to day, all the time. Um, you, you'll see these repeatedly in my work, in my modules, in my scripts. Maybe not as much in my CPAN modules because I tend to try and make them uh, as minimal as possible. But then again, if I'm going to do something tricky and there's a nice lightweight module that'll do it for me, why not? So they make my job easier. They make my code better. And using this stuff makes my code easier to write and easier for others to read, especially me, six months later. It also makes the code easier to maintain because, you know, those bugs, uh, if they do crop up in one of those modules that I've used, the maintainer's probably going to fix them, or you can poke them to fix them, or you can get maintainership. Um, it's really not as hard as people make it out to be. Uh, I have gotten way too many commit bits by saying, hey, I found this bug, and here's a patch, and they're like, here you go, it's yours. So, um, but the bottom line is that for a lot of these things that these modules cover, a lot of the, a lot of the tasks and, and, um, uh, and functions that these cover, uh, you're going to have far fewer bugs in those than in the code that you write yourself. 
because, I mean, I know there's a lot of rock stars in this room, but if it's code you don't write, you know, it's going to be better, I, f at least for me, because I'm not that good, you know, and neither are you. That's right. <laughs> so, there are a people, few, few people who are that good, and you know what? Some of those people took a real long time to get that good, and some of, those, some of these modules have gone through years of iterations just to get better and, um, and, and work out all those corner cases. Do you really want to do that? Let that other fool do, that other very wonderful person do it for you. So um, because of the constraints of time in previous iterations of this talk, of course, my phone won't stay up. Uh, I got a little touchy-feely and waxed poetic about community and how we're all here to help each other out, and, uh, and we give back by, through the CPAN. It's this, this great nexus of our culture and our community, and it's what makes us um, effective programmers, and so, you know, the whole point is to use it. But I already said that. There's simply no time. There's too many modules to cover, too many modules on the dance floor. But all these modules, I prefer Perl because of this variety. There's a lot of tools to choose from, and it's all about getting the right tool for the job, the right tool for you and for your brain and for your team and for your environment. They're, they're all things. We're engineers, we're software engineers, we're programmers, we're sysadmins. So we all have a lot of different um, needs and environments, and we're lucky enough to be able to choose the right tool for the job. No language is perfect, but Perl has the CPAN. And I mean, there, there are so many things in there that are just there to improve Perl and to improve the ways we use Perl. Uh, MST once said something, and this has stuck with me for a few years now, and I've really taken it to heart. Perl is my VM, CPAN is my language. And when you think about that, you know, Perl is this wonderful building material, and, uh, and we built all these components and things that we can plug together and, uh, and continue to aggregate up a much richer, greater language, like, like English over the years, sucking in all sorts of wonderful words and phrases from other languages um, to become something richer and more expressive. So let's learn about some of these parts of the language on the CPAN. And there are a lot of modules in core here. Um, I, I'll try to point them out if I can remember which ones are which. But there's a module for that, by the way. So again, allow me some hubris to tell you the way I do it. And uh, hopefully over the next 40 minutes or so. Right. So first off, the little things, the little things that I tend to find myself adding to almost every script. And they're, they're just little things that are just so useful, so common, um, that you, know, you just got to have them. Strict and warnings. Nobody here is blinking, which is interesting, because I figured people would, would be a little offended that I'd suggest that. But there are so many people, uh, so, so much code I've seen that doesn't use it. And, um, you know, if you're writing anything of any significant size, more than, you know, 50 lines, more than 20 lines, just use it. It lets Perl catch a whole class, um, several classes of errors that, uh, that you can, you know, shoot yourself in the foot with. So, yes. Um, English is another module that I particularly like, and I've gotten some feedback. Some people think it's maybe not entirely essential, but it, since I work with a lot of system stuff, and sometimes I'm reading in files, I'm changing the file separator, it's nice to get English versions of Perl's punctuation vars. You know, like the dollar sign slash and dollar sign comma, and uh, you know, even dollar sign at has one, though most people seem to understand what dollar sign at is. Um, when you use English, something too important, uh, very important to do 
is to specify no match vars because it does import these pre-match and post-match variables that are populated after a regular expression matches. And when you do that, what happens is um, you slow down all of your regular expressions globally. So it's a little bit of a gotcha, but use English is in core. It's been there forever. And here are some of the examples of, um, of the translations. So, you know, if you can't remember if it's dollar sign backslash or dollar sign forward slash, well, when you use English, you've got uh, dollar sign ORS or dollar sign output record separator. I always use dollar sign PID instead of dollar sign dollar sign because it just makes sense to the other guy who's reviewing my code and doesn't know all this stuff like I do. And I don't always know all this stuff myself. OS name, you know, nice and declarative. It makes the code much more pleasant to read. Um, so, and of course, you can get the translation from the names from Perl doc, Perl var, where you also get the actual, you know, um, punctuation vars. Another one that I use everywhere is auto die. And auto die is just pure awesome sauce. It does what it says on the tin, okay? So you use auto die, and now when you call open and it fails, Instead of just failing silently because you might have forgotten to have an or die or something like that at the end, it handles the or die for you. It will do that. It, um, you can specify different classes of, uh, of built-ins to override, or you can tell it to override um, everything. By default, it overrides almost everything except for like system and exec. Um, but you know things that you might not think are going to fail, like chidur, pipe, read line, who here checks every print statement? Yeah, I thought so. I don't. <laughs> so that's going to check it for you. So if print fails, that, that might be something exceptional, uh, something that you want to catch. Um, and when you use it, and this happens when you use these things in void context. Um, when you actually do have an or die, then it lets your or die um, take care of things for you. So it does the right thing. Wonderful, wonderful piece of software. It helps reduce the lines of code you've got to write. It helps reduce the, uh, the, the things that you might end up missing. And it just makes your code clearer um, instead of cluttering it up with, uh, with error handling stuff that the language can now take care of for you automatically. It's a, it's a great win. So uh, the next thing that I use everywhere and, you know, surprisingly a lot of people don't, don't you know, use it. Uh, I'll bet most of you guys do, but data dumper, and there's a lot of other, um, you know, uh, modules that do the same thing as data dumper, like data printer and data dump. Um, and it's certainly better than, uh, than trying to go through an entire data structure and print out all the individual elements. This, you pass it a reference to a data structure or a scalar or whatever, and it dumps the whole thing recursively, pretty printing it onto your standard app. Um, data dump streamer is uh, is one I happen to like. What? Sorry. It re yes, you're right. It does return the string. Um, you have to call print, and uh, it's great if you have auto die there too. So anyway, uh, data dump streamer is um, is another one that can handle even more. Like for instance, um, it can give you uh, sort of a disassembly of closures. So instead of data dumper, um, when it's dumping out a closure uh, or a subroutine, it will just say sub dummy. Data dump streamer can actually dub, uh, dump the body of the sub for the most part. So excellent stuff. You can use these for serialization, and you can use these for debugging. And um, I, I have it in every script. You know, I might delete it at the end, but I use it every day. So now we've got the, uh, the util modules. And these are used quite often. Um, but I'm not going to go into too much depth again because of time and because Steve Lembach has a talk tomorrow morning on utils are your friends. And uh, he's going to cover all three of these in uh, great detail. List util is especially good because um, it, it uses the map and grep type, uh, or uh, list util and more utils use the, the map and grep type style of. Um, of, of functions that they export, um, but you get things like reduce, first, any, um, all for checking, you know, membership in a list in an array, and for doing various processing on things. You can do processing on lists and arrays, zipping them together, um, pairwise. 
um, get an iterator for n arrays at a time. They're very useful. So go to Steve Lembach's talk for more information on the util modules. Parent. So when I'm writing a module and I need some inheritance, I use parent instead of is it these days. Um, why? Because it means I don't have to require the module and then stuff it into isa, and I just feel like it's, it's a bit more declarative. Um, so instead of isa, you use parent, some base, other base. You can have multiple ones um, on there to describe what are the parent classes of your current package. Um, you know, I think it makes things clear and it makes your intentions, it's declaring your intention that th these are parents of the class. Oh, oh, do you have a question? Yeah, I just wanted to say, do you or anyone know the difference between parent and base? You know, I was thinking about that. I'm actually not sure exactly the, uh, the difference. I've grown to use parent. I wouldn't be surprised if parent is actually listed in uh, Task Ken Show. Um, so anyway, if you need exception handling, um, this probably should have gone in a different section of this talk, um, but I do use it when I have uh, certain types of scripts and I want, you know, try and catch functionality. Um, there's also the venerable try catch module, which um, has some very nice extra functionality, but it's very, very heavyweight. You're loading a lot of code in and it's got a ton of dependencies. Try tiny is, you know, very minimal and does the job and keeps you from having to, um, you know, uh, use eval for uh, exception handling. Uh, you have the more familiar try, catch, and finally constructs you know, like here. Um, it's, you know, these are constructs that I think, again, they're, they're declaring your intent. There's a number of reasons why you can do things in an eval, and, you know, if it's to catch exceptions, I like to actually, you know, have the code say that. So, and a very fun module called IO All. It's by uh, Inge, and it aggregates a whole bunch of different I.O. modules and file handling modules into uh, all the, the set of functions and uh, interfaces and objects that is just really great for one-off scripts and, and even larger stuff. Um, so it may not be essential, but it's so much fun to use. I recommend it to everybody. So it's just, it's really handy. Um, you know, you can do call I.O. and pass it a URL and it will actually fetch that URL, and, uh, and then when you read the, the returned variable, it's the contents of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the web server returned. So just all in one little call. But you could also pass it, you know, the name of a file or um, a file handle or all sorts of neat things. So here are the slightly bigger things, the, the, uh, the tools and the larger modules that I use uh, pretty much constantly. Um, so not just modules, but tools like AppCPan minus. Um, if you e either uh, don't want to wait for um, you know for CPan to start up or don't want to configure it, AppCPan minus is very nice because uh, it understands local lib and can automatically, even if you don't have local lib installed, can automatically install files, um, or install CPan modules into a directory under your home directory. And um, you could use that to install local lib into your home directory and then lo load local lib from there as well. And then CPAN will, will use it. So uh, that's actually a pretty big deal. Uh, app ACK. And uh, ACK gives you a command line tool called ACK lowercase a. And ACK is better than grep. ACK is better than grep because it is custom made for grepping through source files. It understands what type of source code are in the source files. It's got all sorts of, of great options for finding things in source code. And it, it's just absolutely indispensable when you've got, you know, more than, you know, five files that you're dealing with in a source tree. Um, you really should just have it on your system because you're going to need it eventually. And finally, Devel NYT Prof. Hands down, the best profiler for Perl, and probably one of the best that I've used anywhere. 
Um, it gives you, uh, when you use uh, dash D NYT prof um, on, the, on the command line, it uh, profiles the code right down to the line. It can even profile inside evals. It can profile processes that you fork. And it gets this down to, you know, millisecond accuracy, telling exactly um, what methods are called, how long they took, how many times they were called. And um, you run uh, NYT prof to HTML and it creates a website that you load up in your browser and, and you can drill down all over your code base to find out uh, w exactly where the bottlenecks are. And, you know, don't guess where the bottlenecks are. No. And NYT Prof makes it so ridiculously easy, it's, it's a sin not to use it. So, um, another thing that's very handy is develop cover. And, uh, you know, when you're writing your tests, yeah? Yes, yes. And it's on the handout here as well. What? Oh, the New York Times. Um, basically, uh, the person who built it uh, built it while at the New York Times, and they allowed him to release it. And uh, it's it's great stuff. So yes, yes. So um, so stop using Devel Dprof because you don't need it anymore. <laughs> uh, Devel Cover. Um, you're writing tests, right? Right. Okay, all right, well, if you're writing tests, Devel Cover will tell you how well your tests cover your code. It will analyze every branch, every if block, you know. It will tell you if there are pieces of code that, you know, you're not testing so that you can pass a different set of arguments in another test to, to reach that if block or cause an exception to happen so that you can then, you know, test your exception handler and, and know what parts of your code are covered under your tests. It's, it's just, it's absolutely great. And it's something that you can give to your manager and say, our code base has 98% test coverage. So you don't want to tell him 100% because then he might not need you anymore. And speaking of tests, huh? Oh, speaking of tests, um, there's utility that's shipped with Perl. So this is core. This is bundled in with Perl. It's part of all the, you know, all the test simple stuff and test more. Um, and it's called Prove. Um, yeah, I think you can install it separately with like app Prove. But uh, it's a command that if you don't know about it, you write your tests, you put them in a slash T directory, and instead of just executing those, um, you run prove, and prove will descend through the slash t directory, running those and taking the test output um, uh, and giving you a nice little report telling you what failed, where it failed, and, and you can do things to get very handy output. You can also use prove because it's using tap harness. You can use it to plug in different type of uh, output. So, um, so prove can, instead of just doing standard tap output, uh, you can make it do output for things like um, uh, JUnit and, uh, and so integrate it with Jenkins that way, for example. Um, it's great stuff. And there are lots and lots of things under test. And I could, I could just do a talk of test that would take 50 minutes of all the different test modules that are so useful to use. So I would recommend that you spend some quality time on CPAN and explore those test modules that are there. Um, so, uh, but you do want to start off with test more and or test most. Test more um, comes with Perl. And test most just uh, builds upon test more uh, with all sorts of additional functionality, including subtests, which is something that I really like. Um, so check both of those out, and uh, you know, you've probably seen them used in various testing courses. All right, here's one more, Perl Critic. Um, I just happen to like this, and it's essential to my workflow. Um, you use Perl Critic, and it scans through your code, and uh, you can write a configuration file that reflects what your coding standards are, or just use the default ones. Okay, for some reason, it's advancing automatically. And uh, you know, it helps you make sure that your code conforms to your quality standards, and your team should have standards and Procritic's a great place to start. It implements, um, you know, a lot of uh, PBP's recommendations, but you can configure it any which way or write your own Critic modules to, um, 
uh, to, to make sure that everything does conform to standards. You know, uh, it's, it's certainly a lot easier than having a person scan everything and trying to catch, you know, those places. And of course, you can tell it to ignore various pieces of code um, pretty easily. So um, I think this is the last thing in this category, but moose, mouse, moo, any moose, um, I highly recommend them. I really do. Um, yes, moose has a lot of dependencies, but it's really not that bad. Yes, it imposes a startup time, but when it's the right tool for the job, it's a damn good tool. And um, you know, you should read up on Moose and uh, go to a, a class on Moose, um, you know, or something. Mouse and Moo are Moose compatible uh, alternatives. Mouse is mostly compiled, um, but there's a per pure Perl module. Either way, it's much lighter weight than standard Moose. Um, and Moo is also a lighter weight Moose. Moo is approximately, but not quite, two thirds uh, of of Moose. Um, so it, it's striving for as much compatibility as possible with as small a footprint as possible, and it's pure Perl. So if that's a requirement, if you can't compile all the uh, dependencies of Moose, um, then use Moo. And finally, you can use any Moose, which if you have one of Moose, Mouse, or Moo loaded, will load whichever one you happen to have. Honestly, things get a little tricky with any Moose, but when you need it, it's, it's great. So stop writing your own OO layers. Stop doing the inconsistency because you remember to do one trick in one class and you remember to do another trick in another class. Stop messing up inheritance, destructors, accessors because I mess those things up all the time because I'm just focused on what I want to do and, uh, and then I, I mess up the, the boilerplate that I have to run right over and over again for classes. So let you know let a, a class uh, toolkit like moose or moo handle all that stuff for you so files and file systems and i'm going to try and speed up here because we're down to about 20 minutes file spec you could join paths like this with a with a slash but you know depending on the platform uh that could be disastrous use file spec and use the catter um, method on file spec or you can use file spec functions and you and import the cat dir function and uh, it will automatically concatenate those with the proper separator for the platform you're on um, it also is declaring what you're intending on doing I'm catting you know the, the directory components I'm catting the components to a file um, to a files path and it will be correct um, rather than breaking when somebody tries to run your code on another platform. It has lots of other functions and they all describe what they do for splitting a path, splitting directories, concatenating path. Um, do you really want to, you know, have to do uh, absolute paths to relative paths on your own? I know I don't because that can get really hairy. Um, it even has handy things for pointing you at the system's tempter and uh, equivalent of del null, dev null. So um, if, uh, if you don't really like uh, um, file spec, path class does uh, basically just about everything that file spec does, but it does it with some, uh, with some magic uh, overloading. Um, so you call the, uh, the dir function or the file function, and you get back essentially a path class object. Um, uh, that represents either a directory or a file. You can stringify them and they do what you expect with the correct separator and everything, or you can call methods on them to get subdirectories or ask for the parent directory, or if it's a file, ask for the directory it's in, and um, you, know, you can change absolute to relative and do all sorts of other things if you prefer an OO style. Part of the point of this talk is you know, not everything here is, uh, you, you don't have to do it my way. Um, find something that fits your team, your workflow, and, and your way of thinking. Uh, just like file find, um, you know, you don't want to traverse directories by yourself, okay? Again, you're not that good. There are too many corner cases, and before I discovered file find, I tried doing this myself. And symlinks can do funny things. Um, yeah. <laughs> Especially on Solaris, too. Um, so. Uh, if you don't like uh, file finds uh, um, interface, 
You can use file find rules which wraps everything up in some, you know, very nice OO sugariness and all sorts of uh, methods for doing extra things like, uh, like finding files with specific extensions instead of having to recognize that within a, within a, a subroutine that you pass to file find. File find rules is, is really great stuff. Um, file touch. How many of you, how would, who wants to answer a question on how would you go about touching a file without file touch? And in Perl? View time. View time. How would you do it on Windows? How would you do it on Mac? Yeah. Well, file touch. File touch will do that across your platforms. Okay. And again, you know, you get a touch, um, you know, uh, function exported that you can then use to touch the file. And there are a number of options. You can pass it um, for, you know, uh, uh, touching, you know, various things. Um, file base name. Actually, that functionality I think is is part of path class, but uh, this is core, and so it allows you to get the uh, the actual file portion of a path, um, and actually the directory portion of the path. So depending on whether you're using base name and dir name, it's just like the system commands. So again, don't parse that path with regular expressions. Uh, file slurp is absolutely indispensable, even though we all know. We all know how easy it is to write a one-line slurp, okay? So what file slurp does is really freaking simple. At least it's, it's basic, you know, thing, all right? It's really simple. Does everybody in this room understand that statement, exactly what it does? Not what its result, but exactly how it works. Really? You guys are good. I underestimated you. This was a 101 talk. <laughs> Whoops. So, um, but, you know, seriously, what's clearer is that or just read file, file text. And there are a number of other subroutines like, um, you know, edit file lines where you can pass it a subroutine to edit individual lines of the file and so filter a file in place, essentially. Um, it can handle um, uh, auto-chomping, right, Uri? Yep, does auto-chomping. It now does UTF, so that is a new feature and, um, it's just, you know, it's indispensable. I, I almost never write a script without it if I'm loading a file. So file read backwards is one of those things that when you need it, you need it. And you don't want to write it yourself. Because I, I had a coworker with a, an IQ of about 30, 40 points higher than mine who started to write this and could not get it to work. And, um, and finally, he, he says, can you take a look at my code? And I'm looking at it. And are you trying to read that log file backwards? He goes, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I just can't figure out why it's not working properly. I was like, well, just use file read backwards. Well, that's what I'm trying to do. Yeah, file read backwards. Go look it up. It, it, was, it was like, you know, a, a, an Abbott and Costello uh, moment there. So he didn't understand that I was telling him about a module, not what he was supposed to do. Um, it must be all those uh, all that time with Lisp we spent. So, so you know, use it when you need it because you don't want to do it yourself. And uh, the author, you know, spent a lot of time making sure that it got right, and he knows his stuff. He's sitting right over there. Um, file temp. Um, let this module handle temp files and directories for you, and uh, and stop just dropping them wherever you think a temp directory should be. Um, you know, that you may or may not be able to write to. There could be several places to put temp files. And uh, there, there are several factors that, uh, that most programs, um, you know, work in to determine where to drop temporary files, um, like the default system location and um, if there may be multiple locations, like on the Mac, and then, of course, environment variables. And what is that variable on the platform that you happen to be on? I don't know. It could be tempter, it could be temp underscore dir, it could be just TMP, depending on the platform and the OS. So, do you ever need to find the home directory of a user? Um, that can actually be torturous because it's not always under slash home, especially not on Windows and not even on a lot of Unix systems, okay? It's, it's, a, it's a tricky problem and uh, Adam Kennedy has solved it for you. File which, okay? Stop shelling out to which. Stop it. <laughs> if I ever see another script that files out to which, 
Because sometimes it's not even where you, sometimes which isn't even installed where you expect it to be, okay? File which will export a which function for you that just does the job and it does it right. You do it in scalar context and you get the first thing like which would, and uh, you do it in um, uh, list context and you get all the things it finds like which-a if your platform supports which-a, which they don't all. File copy, okay? Don't shell out the system to write your own copy routine. Just use file copy. It gives you copy and move subroutines that just do the right thing, and it can move a file between uh, file systems, which, um, which like if you use uh, um, rename, uh, on a file uh, in, built in from Perl, can't do. So, file copy is rather nice. Um, if you need to find out what a file is, file live magic and file mime info. I've gone through a bunch of those. I needed to do some, you know, some detection of files, and those are the best uh, that I could find. Libmagic requires your system has um, libmagic installed, an external library, but file mime info is uh, pure Perl and they both work pretty well. So just stop trying to do it yourself based on the file extension or based on the first couple characters in the file or regular expression because it's fragile. <laughs> so if uh, one of them doesn't work for you, try the other. File path, recursively create and remove directories. So, um, oh, I thought I had a slide in there that had, the, uh, that had some code. Well, I don't, I don't have time. Okay, and file stat, how many he people here hate the way stat works, the stat built in? Yeah, it returns what, 12, 13 different elements? Do you know which element is which without looking at the man page? You know, that's, that's pretty grody. Oh, I guess you could get them one at a time like that. <laughs> that's a way to do it. You know, the, or, the original version of this talk was full of slides like this, and my rehearsals were taking me like two and a half hours. Uh, <laughs> try this instead. It makes stat return an overloaded object, um, so in uh, scalar context. And, uh, and so you can call these methods to get what you want. And it, again, it just makes it, you know, clear and declarative. Um, I'm a big, big proponent in having your code actually say in English what it is you intend on doing. So, wrangling data structures and types. We're down to 10 minutes. Here I go. Um, tie IX hash, tie store to ordered hash. Building your own implementation of these sucks. So just use this. I personally prefer stored order hash, but tie IX hash is the, is the granddaddy there. And uh, so if you need a hash whose elements come out in, in, in some per particular order, you can create it. This exports the ordered function, and you pass it an array, and now you've actually got a hash, and it behaves like a hash. Um, it's, it's tied. Um, and so you can iterate over it in order. There are times when you need that, and you know, it's, it's very handy to reach for. Um, you gotta merge hashes recursively. Do you really wanna walk down through all the data structures? Um, do you need to do depth first or breadth first in your search? Are you going to write those routines every time? No. Okay? Just use it to recursively merge hash structures. It does a great job. It gives you all sorts of options for how you're going to do it. And um, it's, it's pretty darn clean. It's probably as fast as anything you or I would write. Um, so I stole this right from the, uh, the band page. Um, so you've got this hash with nested hashes and you got this one, you merge them, and there you go. It does the right thing, giving, uh, does it give B the precedence? No. Okay, it gives R A, A equals one. I'm getting, uh, ba -doop -ba -doop -doo. A equals 100. Okay, B gets the precedence, yeah. So the last one, you can merge more than two, and I believe, um, basically, they get higher precedence as you go out. So, let's see. Um, but again, you know, it makes you, you declare that you're, you're, you're dealing with something that's ordered and it's going to do it correctly and it does it nice and simply. Params util, it's ugly, ugly, ugly. But if you need to check if something is a particular instance of a class, if you need to check if, um, if an argument passed in is a scalar, or if it's, you don't care if it's actually a hash ref. You just care that it behaves like a hash because it could be tied or overloaded. Okay, this encapsulates all the magic to do that sort of thing. 
Um, so they're ugly, but it does it right. And again, it's, you know, it's pretty much declaring, I want to make sure that this is hash-like. So, and the author is very focused on doing it correctly. Params validate, it is like the de facto standard in parameter validation. I'm gonna start going a little faster. And, uh, you know, oops, algorithm combinatorics um, for getting permutations and iterations and uh, derangements of data. Um, you know, just don't do it on your own. You're going to get it wrong. It will be slow, and it's just going to suck for everybody. Just load this module. It, uh, I believe it, it's written in XS, and it's fast, and it does this stuff correctly. So um, this is another little, uh, little pitch for something I wrote. Um, so set cross product is, has been around for getting the cross product between uh, sets. And I wrote something called set Cartesian product lazy because somebody insisted to me that it's not a cross product, it's a Cartesian product. They both do the same thing. You could try them out. But when you need to get a cross product, rather than writing nested for loops on your own or trying to do the, the calculations of, of what tuples you're going to get next on your own, just use a module, OK? So um, comparing data structures, you can use well, that too. Data compare to recursively and correctly compare data structures. You can use test deep, no test, which has more functionality than data compare. All right. And do you guys mind if I skip over dealing with dates and times? Good. So basically, use date time. Use date time and its friends. Use these to get information um, and to parse it and turn it into a Unix timestamp. OK. Um, you, you can use time piece. It's not essential. OK. Date time tiny if date time is too heavy for you. It's like you know 90% of, of date time. And you can inflate date time tiny objects into date time uh, when you finally need it. So let's see. Date extract. And date extract surprise. I, so anyway. <laughs> So, uh, again, shameless self-promotion, I happen to write that, um, but it, it, it's come in handy and I've helped, had people tell me it, it has. So, reading and writing file formats. YAML any, for when you don't know which YAML implementation to use, just use YAML any. It's simple and it just picks, you know, whatever the best YAML implementation is on your system. Um, and it's got a pretty simple interface. I believe it also has an OO interface, but this is what I usually use, is I import dump and load, and it, uh, you know, it does what it says on the tin. So, JSON. Who here has tried to extract information from JSON with regular expressions? Come on, I knew it. Okay. It's only one of you and you were very brave, so I'm not gonna pick on you much. This is so much easier to JSON from JSON. Again, it's declaring what it is that you're doing instead of writing, you know, gobbledygook that does it instead. Text CSV. Okay, there will be more hands. Who here has tried to parse a CSV file with split and regular expressions? I hate you all. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have in the past, but I quickly discovered text CSV because I got a lot of really, really freaking crazy complicated CSV files, and it handles it with a plum, and it, it goes to the back end, the best back end that you might have, so um, CSV XS or CSV PP, um, pure, pure Perl or XS version, so it'll pick the fastest one you have on your system, and it just does it right. Its interface is a little complicated, but it's OOE and, you know, it just does the job right, and it's a whole lot simpler and better than doing it on your own. There's a lot more functionality. It doesn't have to be comma separated, for example. Um, URI, you want to use URI all the time. Uh, he's sitting right in front here, and uh, he wants you to use him. Uh, um, but if you're dealing with URIs um, or URLs, just use these. Again, don't try and split them up with regular expressions. It's just getting worse now that we have Unicode URIs hanging around. Okay, 414, so we're, we're running up against. Spreadsheet read, got to read spreadsheets? This reads all sorts of spreadsheets. It reads um, uh, tabular CSV, it reads Excel spreadsheets, it reads um, spreadsheets from, uh, from uh, OpenOffice, 
and I'm sure there's a few others out there, and prevent, presents a nice little OO model and interface to work with spreadsheets. XML simple. I'm pretty certain it's in Task Kensho, okay? And for simply reading in and parsing some XML, just use it, and that way you'll get, you know, the actual proper data structure from it. It's got a lot of buts buttons and knobs, but it really is very simple. Um, for the non-simple stuff, look at Task Kensho. There's a bunch of XML modules in there, and you want to pick the one that fits your, uh, fits your stuff. Okay. So I think I'll try and skip over the potpourri unless something catches my eye because we're running down. I think we got, uh, anybody have a time check? 4.15 is when it ends? Oh, okay, five minutes, beautiful. Need to load a module at runtime? And so you've got require or you've got like an eval, you know, a, a string eval that you're trying to do and, uh, and, and there are all sorts of pitfalls. Just don't bother with it. I've, I've pretty much forgotten how to do it the old way because I now use module runtime. Safely and properly load modules at runtime and be able to check if something went wrong as well. So um, IO Interactive, when you absolutely got to know if that, uh, if that file handle uh, is, is an interactive terminal, um, this is the one to use, okay, um, because I doubt you know, I doubt very few people, uh, I, I, I'll bet very few people here know how to actually do it right. Um, you know, I know I don't and I've tried. Uh, IPC run makes it really easy to spawn off uh, additional processes and run them and pipe them together. Um, it's, it's really very nice. And um, so if you need to run commands and pipe, uh, you know, uh, the contents of a scalar into it or pipe the output into a scalar or pipe the output into another process, into another process, and then into a subroutine and then into a scalar, IPC run is just kind of great. And it's, it's very well vetted, you know. Um, it is the granddaddy, yes. So capture tiny for when you've got to capture the standard out and standard error of any code. Capture Tiny, that's the one you want. There's a bunch of, out, bunch of them out there, but uh, Dave Golden uh, wrote this, and he's worked really hard on making it work in just about every case, um, you know, and it just works. So I'm going to skip over net server and net daemon, um, because writing daemons properly is hard, um, and it looks like, you know, people are a little bit more advanced here than I thought. Use this for quoting strings that you're going to pass the shell. If you must pass to the shell, use this. There are so many times where I've fixed nasty little, you know, shell injection bugs just by using this. So I really appreciate it. Um, you know, I, I put it right there. So you think you can do it with a regex and, and escaping all the necessary things, but you're going to do it wrong. <laughs> just use shell quote. And if shell quote doesn't think it can properly escape everything, it throws an exception. Much safer. There is a shell quote, there is a, a, another thing you can export that won't throw an exception, but I don't use it. So IP system simple, use it in tandem with auto die, and um, it makes using system and output capturing safer um, because you can choose to not go to the shell by using system X. And the program, the commands succeed or die. You don't have to check that they returned uh, zero, which is, you know, a little unintuitive uh, with the rest of the programming language. Um, there's also capturing. So when you want to use backticks, you can use capture um, or capture X to avoid uh, shelling, uh, to avoid going to the shell, which I don't think you can do that with backticks. And uh, so the conclusion, I can wrap this up. Okay. Don't take my word for this stuff. I've just spit out a whole lot of uh, modules at you and a whole lot of information. You've got to explore the CPAN for yourself. Okay? If you're just a beginner or even if you're, you're kind, of ex you know, kind of experienced but looking where to go next, the CPAN is where you know, the richer horizons are. Create your own toolkit. Um, try to establish a toolkit for the team you're working with or just for yourself and take it around and learn it and become fluent with it because it's going to make you a better programmer. Your code will be clearer, more consistent. It's going to have fewer bugs. And, you know, these things all install beautifully um, with, with a few, uh, you know, with that note of, like, the file lib magic doesn't always install very well. I excluded 
you know, try catch because it, it just doesn't install cleanly everywhere, for example. Um, you know, when building your toolkit, be consistent, be thoughtful, and what I really want everybody to do is share what you learn. Share what you think are the best and most essential uh, extensions and modules for Perl for the type of work that you do. And, uh, you know, make a bundle. Put, it, put that bundle up on the CPAN. Make a task distribution and put that up there. Okay? Contribute. Help the language continue to grow. I know there's a lot of things that I skipped over and uh, I wasn't able to get into as much depth as I wanted to, but I'll be happy to talk to anybody in the hallway for the rest of this conference. I'm on IRC. Um, my name is Hersinium on IRC, and uh, I will just type that here so you can write it down. Can everybody read that? Hmm? So, I could go like this. There we go. So that's me on IRC. Um, are there any questions, caveats, any, you know, anything I recommended that is actually utter shite and, you know? <laughs> Except for List More Utils. List More Utils has bugs, but I hope Steve Lembach will, will share those with you. However, it's the things that it, the utilities it exports, they're just too useful not to mention. You know, I mean, if you've got a long-running demon, you might have an issue with a few memory leaks. So, all right. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. I uh, thank you.